Nice to meet you guys. I'm Stan. Uh, I've been a software engineer at Stripe for the past three years. I actually started in SF and then moved to Europe. Um, so what is Stripe? Stripe is a platform and a set of APIs to help you build your online commerce. Uh, the, um, the idea is that we provide you payments capabilities, uh, subscription capabilities, the ability to move money around if you're a marketplace, uh, or even incorporation. And what we really want, to, the best way to, 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 to put it for developers, we, we really want to be an operating system for online commerce. Uh, we started with payments, obviously, and the original name of the company in 2010 was slash dev slash payments. So that's how serious we are about trying to build nice OS-like abstractions for online commerce. And so today I'd like to talk to you a little bit about payments, but mostly about APIs, and in particular how we redesigned one of those uh, core APIs or payments APIs to adapt to the complexity of all the payment methods we have uh, in the world. And when it comes to payment methods, the world is uh, not flat. Uh, we've got uh, the big players, Visa, MasterCard, uh, American Express, we are very strong globally. We've got local players in Europe, as an example, Ideal, Zofold, Gyropay, Bank Contact, uh, who are very strong locally, but generally stay local. And we have the new players that try to provide new payment experiences, such as uh, WeChat Pay, Alipay, uh, Google Pay, Apple Pay. And so there's more and more ways to pay for co the customers and less and less time for developers and entrepreneurs to think about payments. And so as a no S for online commerce, we really have as a company to s try to solve that, that, that issue for you guys. And so let's look at uh, the original Stripe uh, payment API as of 2010. Uh, this is a very simple curl command. Uh, you hitting the V1 charges endpoint, you specify an amount, a currency, uh, the card number, expiry, uh, you click enter in your terminal and boom, you're done. You've moved money from uh, the uh, customer credit card account to your Stripe account and, and eventually your own bank account. Uh, it's, uh, it's simple, it's very OS-like again, it's, uh, it's very easy to use, it's beautiful, but it's also uh, quite an illusion. It's an illusion because it makes a ton of simplifying assumptions about the underlying payment method, which is credit card here. Uh, it assumes that the payment method is synchronous, that you get an instantaneous answer about whether the payment is successful or not. It assumes that the payment method is reusable because you can use those 16 digits I mean, as many times as you want. And also assumes that the payment method does not require any form of additional uh, authentication. Uh, you just, uh, the, the digits are the secrets and you don't have a two-way fair or a redirect to uh, authenticate. And so in 2014, when we added our first new non-card payment methods at Stripe, uh, this is how we did it. Uh, basically, when we introduced uh, Alipay, we introduced a new V1 Alipay send SMS endpoint. Uh, when you would hit that endpoint, it would send an SMS to the Alipay user. The Alipay user would push back the, the two FA codes to the merchant website, and the merchant website would post that code back to us. And only after the code was posted back would the send SMS object be usable as a source to the same V1 charges endpoint, right? Uh, when we introduced Bitcoin, we created the V1 Bitcoin receivers, which is uh, an endpoint that you call. It creates a Bitcoin address. The customer pushes the money to that address, and only after the money is received would the receiver become chargeable and be usable with the same V1 chargers endpoint, right? And finally, when we introduce 3D Secure, same thing. You create a 3D Secure object. It generates a redirect URL, so we're all familiar with 3D Secures in Europe and uh, you would redirect the customer there, and only after the redirect is complete would the 3 secure object be chargeable. And so the problem here is that every time we were adding a new payment method, we were adding a new endpoint, and so it really felt like rebuilding a mini Stripe inside of Stripe for every new ways to pay. You had to build that endpoint, obviously, but you also have to make sure that it works well with all of our, all of our different products, such as subscriptions, Connect, or market products, etc. And so that wasn't great for us, and it wasn't great for our users either, because every time we were adding a new payment method, they would have to understand a new endpoint. And so when we realized that as we scale globally, we needed to probably handle uh, dozens, uh, if not hundreds, of payment methods, we decided to redesign that API with those uh, design pr principles in mind. We wanted to uh, segregate the specificity of the payment method from the API constructs. 
wanted to minimize the amount of work required to create a new payment method uh, for us, and doing so minimize the amount of work required by all users to integrate the new payment method. We really believed that uh, the amount of work that we were doing to add a new payment method was a great proxy of the amount of work that was required by all users to add a new payment method. So that's kind of a nice uh, measurement that you can keep in mind. And so when, when, when we look at the different payment methods uh, out there, we realize that you can group them together in four big categories of uh, authentication flows, uh, which is everything that needs to happen before the payment can be uh, executed. And so you've got the non-flow, which is like cards, you don't have to do anything. Uh, a redirect flow, where you send the customer through the redirects, and then when they come back, the payment can be executed. The code verification flow, where it's basically a two-FA code, or a receiver flow, where it's basically you generate an address and the customer has to push funds to that address, and only after the funds are arrived, you can charge it on your Stripe account. And so this is the API we, uh, we came up with. Uh, it's called V1 Sources. And so on the left, you can see the uh, API call to create a source. So it's pretty straightforward, obviously. You create an ideal source, so ideal is a Netherlands redirect-based payment method, and you specify a name. Uh, ideal requires you to specify your bank, and you specify your return URL as a merchant, and this is the object that you're going to get. Uh, it's a source object. It has an ID, a creation time, a currency, uh, an amount. It has the flow, so that's, that's the flows that we were talking about. Here it's a redirect, a bunch of uh, standardized information, such as metadata, the owner information, which is the information, the billing information about the customer. It has a status, whether it's pending or chargeable. So here it's chargeable, so you can use it, you can call V1 chargers with it. And it has a type. And since it's a redirect flow, we also had a standardized redirect sub hash that shows everything that you need as a developer to manage your redirect. So a fail of reasons eventually, the written URL that you specified, and the URL where you want to send the customer. And finally, since it's uh, an ideal source, we also have an ideal sub hash that includes all of the uh, ideal specific information. And the interesting bit here is that all of the fields here, uh, except the ideal one, are really standardized across payment methods. So this one is for all of the redirect payment methods. It will be the same everywhere. And all of those other ones are standardized for all the payment methods and are all that you need to understand to interact with the rest of Stripe. And so that means that in your code, if you have a source, you don't need to know how it came to existence. You can use it with the rest of the API in a very standardized way. And so once you get to that object, you send the customer around. Uh, they come back, it becomes chargeable, and you can call V1 chargers, the same endpoint that we saw at the beginning. You just specify the source as a ID as a source. And so when uh, you move into uh, uh, Germany, so that was Netherlands, you will probably want to support uh, Zofort. And so Zofort will look like this. You specify type Zofort. It's also a redirect payment method. Zofort asks you to specify a country. It's kind of a little bit lurky, but that's how they work. So you specify Zofort country. And you get back a, a source that looks really alike with the Zofort specific information. And where we believe it was a good API is because if you compare Ideal and Zofort, I mean, they're virtually the same objects. So as users, you really, if you pay the price to understand how redirect work uh, for Ideal, then it's going to be very easy for you to move on to the next payment method, such as Zofort. Same goes for, an, so it's another example of flow. SEPA credit transfer. So SEPA credit transfer is uh, you create a source that will generate a virtual IBAN uh, where the customer will send funds, and when you receive the funds, you can charge it and get the money in your account. And so in that case, um, we you create a SEPA credit transfer source. You don't need much information. Uh, you just need basically the email of the customer. And you get back a source that looks the same for all the standardized parameters, but in, since it's a receiver, you have a receiver sub hash uh, with the address, which is a standardized name for all receivers. And in that case, the address is a, like a, an IBAN, a real IBAN. So you can go into your bank account and push money there. And in that case, we have a, a, a like specific to SEPA credit transfer way of showing it. We call it an IBAN here, but it's the same IBAN, obviously. And if you build a solution for SEPA credit transfer, and then you go globally, and you go into U the US, you may want to use ACH credit transfer. In that case, again, 
obviously it's all the same. The address is this, which is routing number, account number, and so basically it generates uh, an American account number. It has a different ways of representing the US specific information, but all the rest works exactly the same. So the uh, V1 sources API here really, uh, as we've seen, uh, managed to serve as a great abstraction boundary in our API. Uh, and you would have the, all of the complexity about authorizing a payment happens through the V1 sources endpoints. And once you get a chargeable source, you can really use it with all the other APIs that we provide for subscriptions, connect, etc., uh, in a very standardized way. But remember that we uh, also wanted to really minimize the amount of uh, code that we had to write in our API to add a new payment method. And so that's the reason why we didn't stop to, the, to an API. We also designed a reverse API. And so what the hell is a reverse API? A reverse API is an API specification that we created and that our API calls into, I mean, calls into services that comply to that specification to make the V1 sources interaction possible. Basically, in payments, you've got many synchronous interactions. If I'm creating a, an ideal redirect uh, uh, source, I need to get synchronously the redirect URL that has been generated by ideal. And so that's the reason why we cannot just go into our API and, and, and stop. We really need to talk to somebody else outside. And if we don't want to have any payment method specific code in our own API, the best way to do it is to define that reverse API such that we can put all of the payment method specific code into what we call adapters. And so all of the lucky, ideal, complicated, I mean, ideal is great, but lucky, ideal, complicated code uh, goes into that adapter and doesn't radiate back into our API. And so this boundary here is a like real API boundary, meaning that we go through the network following that reverse API and our API called that adapter. And this is actually the exact amount of code that we have to write to add ideal into the Stripe API. So basically, we specify that it's an ideal payment method, it's a redirect flow, it has a provider called currents, it shows it specifies the present currencies, specifies all of the parameters that are expected, as well as the URL of the service that implements the reverse API uh, specification that we call into. And so that is uh, really a win for us because it means that this is the, all of the code change in our own API. And so if we don't just need to do that to add a new payment method from an API perspective, uh, we believe that our users will also probably have to, to add something that is not much bigger than that amount of code to add support for ideal uh, if they already build on Stripe. I mean, it doesn't make magic happen. Uh, all of the complexity happens here, but at least, as we've seen in the beginning, there's no new endpoint that is payment specific, and there's nothing to reconstruct. Everything works well inside the inside our API. And finally, we didn't again. We didn't stop here. We actually uh, like build against that reverse API ourselves, uh, building integrations to all of the payment methods out there. And once we felt like it had reached a great uh, level of reliance and, and design, we actually uh, created uh, what we call the payment provider integration guide, which is a documentation of how our reverse API work for payment methods to make themselves available on Stripe, which means that if you're a payment method, you can basically contact us and say, hey, we'd really love to work with you guys, and we, can, we would be willing to do the engineering work to uh, add, make ourselves available on Stripe. And since we, we're not in the business of picking which payment method is the best or, 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 or not, we're really happy to, uh, to open the door and have them build against Stripe. And today on Stripe, there are actually a bunch of payment methods that have been built that way, meaning that all of the payment method stuff is done by the payment method itself, and we only call into that reverse API to them. And actually, uh, uh, we've, we've actually given that guide and opened the APIs to uh, Satispay in Italy. And so uh, if you want to use Satispay on Stripe, uh, I think the Satispay guys are here today. You just go get them and ask them to work on that. <laughs> all right, uh, so that's all that I, that I had for today. 
uh, we, uh, as I mentioned, I, I moved from SF to Europe, and we're actually uh, building uh, a pretty small team uh, in Dublin. To, uh, as you've seen, a lot of things in payments and commerce are kind of uh, geography specific, and really building a small team, engineering team to uh, crack Europe. Uh, we have a good coverage of Europe, but we can do much better, and so we're hiring in Dublin to, to do just that. And it's going to be a very small startup uh, start team, so it's uh, a lot of fun. So if you are interested in that, or if you have any questions on anything about Stripe, feel free to uh, shoot me an email at uh, Stan Stripe. Thank you. <laughs>